Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this next hour. I'm Vanessa Pineda, the Engagement Lead on INFER and Managing Director at Cultivate Labs. As many of you know, INFER has launched a new forecasting topic on synthetic biology, and we're excited to host today's fireside chat to give more context around how synthetic biology will shape the future of U.S. competitiveness. Before I turn it over to our moderator and our special guest, just a bit of quick housekeeping. We are recording this session. All participants are currently muted. Please make sure all the mics remain off. We're gonna save some time for questions at the end. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom there of the screen to submit any questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Beth Sanner. Beth is currently a professor in practice at the University of Maryland's Applied Research Lab for Intelligence and Security and CNN National Security Analyst. Beth is former Deputy Director of National Intelligence and served as the President's Intelligence Briefer. Uh, thank you for being our moderator, Beth. I'm gonna kick things over to you. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to have Andy Kalansky with us. Um, I know of Andy a little bit um, from my previous uh, position in uh, ODNI when he was one of the senior scientists at DOD. Andy is now the senior director for emerging infectious diseases at the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, IAVI, and an adjunct professor at George Mason University Shar School of Government. A lot of great people are there, a lot of my former colleagues and current friends. And um, as I mentioned, Andy was a senior scientist and program manager at DOD. So we're really fortunate to have you here, Andy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Beth. And thanks to the Infer team for the invitation. Great. I mean, I want to welcome everybody here. Um, you know, the uh, Infer forecasters, this is why we do this is for you. And um, we really care about each and every one of you, and we want to make your participation in INFER as fun and interesting and exciting um, as I find it. So we're glad you're here, and uh, we also welcome everybody else who's in attendance. This is such an important topic. Um, you know, synthetic biology is, uh, we're really at the cutting edge. We're at the beginning, uh, but we're already seeing things happen here. So today, we're focusing on this issue and uh, we're going to dive deep, but I want to start first by asking Andy a personal question. Um, so how did you become a scientist and then, uh, you know, like a biologist and you know, fall into this really interesting niche profession? Yeah, so uh, um, that's a great question to kick things off, Beth. Uh, you know, uh, I've always been interested in discovery, right, and working on the problems that no one else knows, right? We don't have solutions uh, to these problems. And so, you know, I started um, as a microbiologist, you know, very early in undergrad and, and took some classes in high school, too, in that area and found I, I had some really good advice from a mentor. Uh, and he said, if you want to understand how everything works, start small. Uh, and I wasn't much into physics. Uh, so, you know, I, I went uh, a step up into the micro world, uh, learned about bacteria, viruses, and, you know, how they interact with us and, and the rest of the world, and really learned quickly that, you know, through all the great work that's been done in the microbiology and virology fields over the past, you know, hundreds of years, we're now in, in uh, a time and space where we are able to manipulate these living organisms right, to do things that we weren't able to do even a few years ago. Uh, so it's just, there's been, you're always in that discovery mode. And that's a really cool thing about our topic today, synthetic biology. Uh, like you mentioned, it's one of these emerging technologies that, that gets talked about, it gets lumped in with other emerging tech. It's really unique. And we are really on that leading edge in terms of where synthetic biology and our ability to manipulate the living world, where it's gonna take us in the future. Well, that's a good segue into maybe getting a little bit more um, concrete in defining what is synthetic biology. You know, how does it differ from traditional biology? You've touched a little bit on that. Yeah, so so there there's various definitions out there. Uh, the way that I think of synthetic biology is really being able to work with living organisms and living systems in a way that is reproducible and that is programmable like we think about engineering, 
So really, you know, applying engineering principles to biology. Uh, you know, as a, as a biologist, it's certainly not that simple. Um, and so seeing some of the, the great work that's been done in the community to take these, you know, proteins and, and really living circuits and manipulate them into a way that's like an, uh, an electric circuit, for example. Um, really fascinating work. And I, because these systems are so complex and really we, it just in biology terms, you know, writ large, we know so little about how everything works. Uh, we're only going to get better and better at fine tuning our approaches in the synthetic biology arena. Um, right. So right now there, there's a lot of work in using bacteria and yeast and, um, you know, in vitro type systems to make uh, small molecules or to make products to do biomanufacturing. Um, and like I said, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And really a lot of that work has come off discoveries that have happened over the past 100 years. Uh, and we're just starting to integrate some of these new tools that we're discovering into that workflow. I will try not to go on a tangent this early. So I'm going to hold back my excitement because I, I saw this video yesterday that I want to talk about, <laughs> even if we don't get it today. Um, anyway, so, all right, so we've defined it. So now um, let's talk about why this is important to us as a human species. Like, why should we all care? I, I don't think there's any more relevant time than right now to be caring about, you know, synthetic biology and where biotechnology is going to bring our you know, human race and our planet into the future. Uh, climate change is an existential threat to all of us. It's a threat to the U.S. national security. It's a threat to, you know, our entire planet. And we've seen the impacts of things like COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic that we're currently in and that we can't get out of. Uh, you know, the, the living world is going to keep throwing us curveballs. And uh, if we don't get ahead of some of those problems and think creatively about how to solve things like, um, you know, the, the climate crisis, uh, you know, we're not going to be around for very long. And so synthetic biology and understanding the living world and how it all interacts together and ways that we can use those tools that nature's developed, maybe we can augment some with, with some of the uh, in silico and, you know, machine learning approaches we're applying to designing these systems. Um, but really learning as much as we can about how the world all connects together on the living side and how we can use that to reverse some of the, the damage right that we've caused to the planet as humans and ensure that as we go forward and we continue to, to develop you know, societies and as a, as a human race, we're looking out for the future. And these tools are really some of the best tools that we have to reverse some of that, that climate change that's been happening. Um, and beyond that, things like future pandemics and emerging infectious disease threats, uh, food insecurity. Uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of the, the drought impacts around the world right now. Those are problems that synthetic biology can solve. Um, and we are we're just creeping into that area with, with uh, synthetic biology right as a field. And so really, I, I think the next 5, 10, 15 years are going to be transformative and how we think about these tools that we're developing kind of at the micro scale and how we apply them at the macro scale to some of these huge existential problems that we face. So I, I think I mentioned this to you before. Um, I saw this video about, uh, this is different than the one I saw today, um, about growing meat. Is that an example of, of this? So I think the, the current commercializable, uh, you know, synthetic meats products, um, we haven't fully grasped the toolkit yet and how to apply that. And so for things like food insecurity, right, and the impact that, um, you know, the unsustain, unsustainable meat farming practices that, that are, are used, you know, here in the U.S. and around the world, um, getting to those synthetic animal-based products uh, without the animals it, it is a huge leap where synthetic biology can help us uh, put that together. I think when you look at the, the current, you know, cultured meat products that are out there on the market, there's still room for improvement and there's ways that synthetic biology can make those products cheaper um, and more sustainable, right? So that they are able to replace the relatively inexpensive farming practices, you know, that are used for our current sources of animal protein. Yeah, the one I saw was they were growing basically a pound of meat. 
and it would come out in these packages of a pound. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm ready to eat that or not, but <laughs> you know, we might have to. Um, okay, well, so everybody is is kind of on the verge of, of discovery here. And we have a lot of interest around the world, um, countries, private sector, because it has huge commercial interests. What does the competitive uh, landscape look like? in synthetic biology. Yeah, and you know, the competitive landscape question is one of the reasons why we're here with our forecasters today. Uh, we are early in the commercializable impacts of synthetic biology and taking some of those approaches out of a research setting, right? And putting them into a setting that is commercializable, whether that's for manufacturing, whether that's for um, uh, uh, producing sustainable food products, and whether that's for impacting the climate in positive ways that can make money. Uh, that's really the, the challenge that we all have is, is uh, identifying that competitive landscape and looking for where there might be opportunities, right, to influence. Um, because we are so early, a lot of the work and research that's being done especially in, in biofuels, for example, uh, right? That's, that's done uh, both in some, you know, commercial grade settings, like with some of the big oil and big energy companies that are out there, because uh, they recognize, right, the, the potential impact of this, or it's done in the more venture space and startup world uh, for discoveries that are translated out of, you know, research laboratory settings, you know, into smaller scale type companies. And because of that, right, we don't really have a lot of ability to understand like we do with traditional life science competitive landscape analyses, right? Where you look at things like publications, where you look at things like, you know, government investment in these areas, because we're at this, you know, early stage where there's huge economic impact in the bioeconomy. And everyone can see that, but we're not yet at the place where we're able to quantify that competitive landscape is, is very difficult to assess. Um, I'd say that that right now, when you look at some of the national and you know multinational strategies that have been developed, uh, the U.S. has a you know a bioeconomy strategy from a few years ago. Uh, the European Union has one. Um, uh, China has one, and and we're we're seeing the growth of the realization that the bioeconomy and the biotech sector is going to be a large contributor to GDP in the future. That. Now there's a tension, right? That there's energy and there's policies in place to start promoting these activities, but we haven't yet seen that that translate into a lot of um, uh, injection of of funds and capital from a government perspective, right? Things that from a competitive landscape you, you're able to track in some other areas, we don't yet have that for synthetic biology, and so we're very early. And so I think really the competitive landscape is is pretty wide open at this point. There, there's a lot of ability to impact future directions, both in parts of the world, like the US, for example, as well as in the international community, which is you know very integrated and tied together on this topic. So what is the role then of, of governments versus private sector at this stage? So at this stage, and, and we've seen some um, you know fits and starts, and I'll, I'll take the US government as the example here, right, of research programs and efforts that are designed to harness the tools that synthetic, the synthetic biology community is discovering into more um, scaled up approaches, right? So taking something that maybe you can do with a synthetic yeast strain in a you know, lab scale bio fermenter, right? And scale that up into a large scale process akin to you know, a brewery or an oil refinery or something like that. Um, the the government funded efforts is as you know as far as i know are still pretty nascent in those areas and i you know posit that the commercial sector and in some of these you know stealth venture backed companies and in, in in some of these you know harder to understand commercial areas that are more or less opaque right to, to someone from the outside uh that's happening a lot faster there and so before, especially when we talk about the emerging technologies, right, that, that infer uh, cares about things like quantum or artificial intelligence, uh, we're really, you know, the U.S. government and national security communities in some cases are the drivers for that innovation. I think here, because those applications aren't as readily apparent, it really is 
the economy. It, it's the commercial space, which is going to be the driver of innovation and discovery. And so there's going to have to be some crosstalk between those um, in a way that maybe, you know, from the U.S. government perspective, we haven't had to do so much before. You know, when you look at some of the, the technology arcs that currently exist for things that are mature, whether that's the Internet, whether that's 5G, uh, a lot of these things were driven by the U.S. government and uh, the U.S. government national security community. Yeah. Right. Uh, and without that, you know, current focus within, you know, the U.S. on the bioeconomy, although that's coming, right, and really synthetic biology and the toolkits that are available there, um, we're not in that same mold. So it's a different, it's a different environment. And that's why it's such a challenge to assess things like competitive landscape and, and futures analyses on things like synthetic biology, because these predictable indicators that we might have in things like AI or hypersonics, right, which are inherently, you know, government uh, related activities, we don't have that. Yeah, so it does seem like it depends on the part of synthetic biology, right? Because with COVID-19, we did have a big government uh, influx of investment, right? He here, and also in the EU, I guess, and certainly in China, there was quite a bit of that. But, but if you look at like synthetic biofuels, there's, I guess, less. Is there anything in the new bill on, on that? Yeah, so uh, the CHIPS Act, right, recently came out, and now that was focused more on microelectronics and promoting um, U.S. accessibility, right, to domestic sources, uh, you know, of microchips and, and microprocessors and, and things that enable artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, quantum computing, things like that. Um, on the synthetic biology side, when you look at that act, there is a provision in there, um, really more of exploring how the government might want to uh, promote or work with uh, the commercial sector and international sectors on uh, synthetic biology and really biotechnology writ large. So uh, in that act, they talk about standing up um, an office at the White House, uh, whose goal it is, is to really help to assess that landscape and determine, okay, from a government perspective, we understand the bioeconomy and synthetic biology are going to be, you know, big economic security uh, pieces, big national security pieces um, in the future. So how do we go about it in the right way? Much like uh, the AI commission um, mm -hmm. and some of the other activities that have been run out of the White House with respect to emerging technologies. Um, so, you know, we're starting to see this acknowledgement of the bioeconomy as something that's critical and synthetic biology obviously is a huge contributor to the bioeconomy how we're going to compete with the rest of the world, right? Ensure that US companies in this space, right? Have uh, a fair shake compared to, you know, companies in other parts of the world. Um, I don't think we're there yet. So then always the elephant in the room when we talk about these technology topics is China. So China has a big five-year plan on all these technologies and has a special part of that that is with, biotechnology, what are they up to and how does it compare to what we do? Yeah, so so the bioeconomy and the biotech sector um, has been talked about as of strategic importance to Chinese leadership going back a while now um, in a way that maybe you don't see from, you know, U.S. Um, government leadership. So, uh, you know, uh, China's 13th five-year plan was all about you know connecting their research infrastructure with the rest of the world, bringing talent and bringing in smart, um, able people to be able to grow research programs and do that translational work right from the laboratory into the commercial sector. Uh, their 14th five-year plan is very much focused on growing what they've brought in domestically um, and you know working with those parts of the economy that are going to be major drivers in the future things like the bioeconomy and the biotech sector. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, uh, China has uh, added a supplement to that 14th five-year plan specifically on the bioeconomy um, and, and the biotechnology uh, ecosystem uh, within China and how that relates to the rest of the world. So in some ways, from a strategic perspective and um, laying out 
how China sees, you know, their biotech and bioeconomy, um, you know, interfacing with the synthetic biology community as well as um, working and plugging into the rest of China's economy, uh, they might be a step ahead. Um, now, you know, a lot of the the ideas in this space aren't incredibly novel. I mean, we've been talking about these things for years now, but we're at a point where implicating those policies and strategies are going to maybe provide an edge in a competitive landscape. Um, so China's thought about this a lot. Um, you know, Xi has talked about biotechnology and its importance to to China's future and really the world's future. So, so there's a really tacit acknowledgement that if China wants to continue to, you know, be competitive with the U.S. in terms of near peer status, uh, biotechnology is going to be a critical enabler of that. And the synthetic biology world, where we're able to manipulate these living processes into things that might be cheaper to manufacture, easier to manufacture, um, open up some new realms of possibility that we didn't think before. It's going to be a major driver uh, of the Chinese bioeconomy, the U.S. bioeconomy, and as a result, the international economy, um, right, and how we're all tied together uh, going forward. Do they have any specific priorities within that in terms of the specific technologies or commercial sectors they're focusing on? Yeah, so uh, China tends to blend some of the biomedical and non-medical technologies together, uh, which I think is, is definitely one way to do it. When we think of the bioeconomy here in the U.S., we tend to silo off things like healthcare and pharmaceuticals in like another bin per se, and really focus more on the emerging perspective of, of the bioeconomy and where are these new technologies, how are we going to integrate them into something that that provides, you know, competitive advantage for the U.S. Um, China takes a little bit more of a holistic approach. And so in terms of specific areas that they're focused on, um, I, I think from what we've seen in terms of strategy and, uh, you know, specific details, infrastructure is a big piece. Um, and that's infrastructure, not only, you know, physical infrastructure, things like um, some of their um, science and technology cities, right, that are really focused on a certain topic, starting to bring biotech and synthetic biology into that realm, um, but also people, right? So, uh, you know, when you compare the numbers of, you know, graduate students in these areas here in the U.S. and in China, um, you know, they're way outpacing us. And so leveraging this incredible advantage in uh, people capital that they have in these areas is underpinned really throughout a lot of their um, strategic documents and the way they think about this. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the U.S. versus China, it sounds like to me that the ratio of government to private sector is almost opposite uh, where we are right now. You know, like for in the United States, you might say that like government might be 20 percent and private sector is 80. I'm making this up. And in China, maybe it's the opposite or maybe those numbers are a little bit different. But but that basically you, you have a kind of reverse re ratio of government um, support versus private sector leadership. Yeah, so I, I definitely think there are differences there. Um, like you said, hard to quantify exactly the contributions yeah. from the government in terms of infrastructure, dollars, you know, non dilutive capital, uh, yeah. things of that nature, and what we do here in the United States. Um, and that's, again, why this is such a great topic for forecasting, because there are a lot of other aspects of importance that are out there that maybe aren't as easily quantifiable right, for some of the, you know, uh, data analytics folks out there who are looking at this problem. Um, I, I will say just on on paper, right, and, and in some practice, uh, not only the biotech bioeconomy integration on sort of the government-sponsored research and development side in China, um, but also the integration of other technologies together, uh, I think there's 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 some advantages in the way that they're thinking about putting these these pieces all sitting in one place, thinking about these problems together. When you look at the Chips Act, um, again, which was recently passed here um, and, and signed uh, in the U.S., there is a provision there for the Department of Energy to focus a lot more resource on biotechnology, um, right? To use things like their incredible uh, computing capacity. Right, to tackle some of these um, problems that really underpin how we want to use synthetic biology in the future. So 
if we can predict how proteins fold and how proteins interact and do all of these predictive models in computers, that then we can demonstrate are effective and learn those models right from wet lab type research. You're at the point where you can design these, these fully living systems in silico and then translate that, right, and do a lot of the troubleshooting and really the um, trial and error that is traditionally done, right, in biology today in a wet lab environment. You do all that with supercomputers at the Department of Energy, right, and then, then you have processes which have been validated, run through their paces um, synthetically that we can then take and really have a, a, a you know, leaps and bounds above where we are now in terms of some of that trial and error and how it's done. So while China is is integrating the, those technologies right now and thinking about ways to really build, you know, biotech computing centers of excellence and things of that nature that are sponsored by, you know, the Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology um, with a lot of money and a lot of resources and, and you know, political will. Here in the U.S., we're starting to, to get into those arenas. And I, I think when you look at how we've thought about other emerging technologies, a lot of the enablers are there. And they're the same across the board. Uh, so you, quantum computing, for example, if, if we can solve that problem, uh, that's really going to help us in, in synthetic biology and biotech. Uh, if we start to understand how the brain works really well, well, then we can design better neural networks for artificial intelligence purposes. Um, really, all of these emerging technologies are starting to tie together. And the CHIPS Act here in the US was a great realization of that fact. Right, that we can't silo ourselves in how we think about technology development. And these things really do all connect. And that is a very hard thing to quantify and assess. Right. It's hard enough for us to, to determine, you know, what's yeah. going to be the impact on the US GDP of the bioeconomy in 10 years, but also how is the bioeconomy going to accelerate uh, you know, our ability to you know, be world leaders in artificial intelligence. Right. Well, let me let me hold on that question of how do we might measure this and ask you, can you can you um, talk about what does the U.S. ecosystem for bio synthetic bio look like? Like, who are the players? Yeah. So uh, the players are, I think, in this space mostly academic laboratories and companies that have spun out of those discoveries, um, right? So there is a, uh, a growing, you know, um, venture backed uh, arena of biotechnology. And a lot of those companies have taken uh, tools and uh, other enablers and discoveries that have come out of, you know, NSF or NIH funded research, for example, um, and translate those into uh, companies, right? That are chasing um, a future market. When you look at our existing uh, industrial bases and, and parts of our economy, you know, I think the um, the energy sector is where from a, you know, commercializable standpoint, and we're talking non-medical here, you know, the pharmaceutical sector obviously employs the synthetic biology toolkit, um, although there are some barriers to that in terms of um, using products that are in people and, and, and you know, that there's challenges there that the pharmaceutical sector is overcoming in addition to integrating synthetic biology into how they do business. But on the non-medical side, if you're talking food, ag, or energy, for example, um, that's where I think we're going to see some of those transformational leaps. And it's going to happen in ways that maybe we're not able to predict, right? So oil prices drive a lot of the energy sector's um, views on the attractiveness of synthetic biology for energy production. Um, once we get to a point where we acknowledge, right, that fossil fuels are finite and uh you know the way that we currently do energy and the way that the u.s identifies energy independence and and those sorts of you know high level um you know policy type decisions once we identify that, that really using that using synthetic biology to produce energy is where we all have to go eventually um the sooner that we understand i think in the the context of climate and things that we've discussed already that the biotech toolkit is where we need to focus, um, we might see some of these discoveries that might actually already exist out there in the private sector really materialize as impactful from a, from a market perspective. Yeah, I can see some of these big companies 
you know, being real drivers of innovation just because they have a lot of money, right? The Cargills and the and the Exxon Mobiles, you know, they're looking at their future and trying to define it themselves. So can you give an example of how um, synthetic bio in the, um, in the energy world, like what are some specific technologies that you think are potentially emerging there? Yeah. So, you know, going back and looking at, you know, uh, biology for fuel, um, you know, the way we do some ethanol production here in the U.S., right, is, is based on plants, um, right? So, so that, right, uh, you know, kind of distilling it down to its, um, you know, most basic forms, you know, we already have biofuels. I think that the challenge that we have now, right, is harvesting a ton of corn. Um, that's energy intensive, right? That might not be the most environmentally friendly way to do things. And from a policy perspective, uh, right, there are reasons why you want to secure your fuel infrastructure in ways that you're not depending on, you know, a plant growing, right, right, to harvest fuel from. Um, so synthetic biology, right, the, the ability of things that have done fermentation for us in the past, yeast, bacteria, um, and really being able to tune them to take advantage of the most accessible resources uh, so those bacteria and yeast can grow and ferment and create products that are currently used in um, petroleum refining, for example. And we're seeing examples of companies, chemical companies, uh, petroleum, the petroleum sector, finding ways to integrate bacterial and yeast fermentation and other tools into how they're producing energy today. The challenge is, is I think, right now, it's not at a cost benefit ratio that really allows for the full adaptation of those, those technologies in, right? So either through policy, right, dictating that certain sectors will use these tools, Right, that's one way to drive innovation, right, and one way to, to drive costs in a, in a productive area on the short term, right, but in the long term and how we include things like synthetic biology into these processes. Um, or if we have it, if we, you know, revisit some energy crises and now like oil is $150 a barrel or $200 or, or whatever that might be where the U.S. from a fuel security perspective, right, might not, might not be there like we are today. Um, I think we're in a pretty comfortable environment, even with everything that's been happening in terms of energy security here in the U.S. and really the impacts of thinking about alternative ways to do this, uh, you know, on the commercial sector haven't been there. Yeah. Right? If we make concerted policy decisions to move in that direction or from a competitive landscape, we identify some of these threats to our energy independence and security here in the U.S. that really synthetic biology is going to help us solve. Um, that's where those innovations are going to pop. And so we're seeing kind of the bits and pieces come into these, these different um, flows and commercial processes and things like that. Um, I think we are, we're on the precipice of, of transformation, but only if we have those right factors come together to drive it. So let's get back to that question of how do we know if we as the United States or any other country is doing well in this? Because we can't necessarily count the number of cited um, cited research in published documents because companies are doing a lot of this. Like, it, are we able to measure in some way how we're doing? Yeah, it's, it's, as someone who, who used to get asked these questions, uh, really challenging to do because our, our you know, classic tools of, um, you know, cinematrics of looking at things like publications or patents or, uh, you know, research grants, uh, things of that nature. Like you said, but, you know, the, the field is moving into stealth mode, right? Where these discoveries and these um, innovations are going to be hugely monetarily, you know, beneficial for, for these individuals. Um, we're starting to see right indicators of that already with, with a lot of the, the VC attention in this area. Um, quantifying that is, is becoming harder and harder. So, you know, what, one of the ways that folks have thought about doing this is to kind of go further back in the process and look at things like education, um, you know, um, human capital, uh, infrastructure, right, right, things that you would think maybe from a sin bio perspective, maybe are, are less important because these are happening at smaller scales, but 
by looking at, at what's available in this area, um, oh. that's one way that you can look at the future potential. Now, will it be impactful, right? Will those resources be utilized uh, correctly? And, and will policies and funding and the markets evolve in a way that makes it pop, <laughs> essentially? Because I, I, I think we're all kind of waiting for one of these companies or one of these, you know, Symbio innovations to have a really impactful um, output on how we do the commercial manufacturing that we do today. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're very close to that. And so, you know, an angle of the forecasting arena is, you know, when is that going to happen that's going to illuminate synthetic biology as a field that everyone needs to be in? Or, you know, who has the best toolkit from a national and then, you know, collaborative international perspective to get to some of those areas first, even if those markets haven't been eliminated yet. Yeah. So what do you think are the things that are going to um, kind of be in the way of the United States being a major leader in this area? You know, the barriers and the challenges. Yeah, uh, you know, I saw an article, yes, I think it was yesterday, about the need for a million talents program here in the U.S. Um, and I really do think that, you know, the U.S.'s preeminence in, in educating uh, has been really impactful when we think about emerging technologies. Um, you know, if, if we don't maintain our focus on that and bring in the best and brightest people from around the world um, yeah. and really having them learn science and technology here in the U.S., uh, we're going to be at a big disadvantage. And you know, to China's strategy in this area, you know, the 13th five-year plan, um, right, they realized, right, that that if they wanted to truly be a near-peer competitor in emerging technologies, right, that are going to have a, a large economic impact, they had to have a domestic organic workforce in China, right, they had to grow internally. And not only that, they had to attract folks in from around the world because diversity of thought, right, is, is, is one of the best ways to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a huge piece in maintaining our, our preeminence in these areas. Um, you know, one of the other barriers, it's, it's a related barrier, uh, but the um, some of the, the decisions that have been made recently in terms of supply chains and yeah. uh, supply chain security and things like that and not offshoring capability, um, those are important considerations to keep in mind. However, I think it's very clear that we can't all do this in the U.S., right? I, like if we're saying, you know, SynBio is national security and we're going to make sure that we can do all the SynBio, you know, here in the U.S. in a way that's insulated from supply chains and other um, factors from around the world, right? that's impossible. Um, and we're already seeing movements to offshore a lot of the, the, the toolkit, essentially, that you might want to use to do synthetic biology. Uh, so whether that's DNA synthesis, right, to build constructs that you might use in the laboratory or um, sequencing materials and understanding how your synthetic uh, organisms are evolving in cell culture. You know, all these things that we might use, a lot of those, it makes a lot of sense to offshore from an economic perspective. Um, and we're starting to see the data analysis piece follow that. So we have to be, in terms of U.S. competitiveness in this area, we have to be really cognizant that the insulation approach is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, now, there might be some things that, that you want to insulate over others, but the, the sooner we realize that this world and ecosystem is really interconnected on the global scale, uh, I think the better we're going to be at removing some of those roadblocks to the U.S. government or the Defense Department, right, being more involved in, in the technology development. So I guess COVID-19 vaccines is an example of how there was this collaboration, at least between companies, but also I think between the EU government and the United States. I mean, the central um, decision-making body there. Uh, so how... Who are these, where are these places that the offshoring is going? Are these, is it, you know, this friend shoring as people talk about it? Yeah, so uh, I would say in the, in the biotech, you know, uh, bioeconomy uh, perspective, there isn't really any, any friend shoring, I, I think at this point. I think really 
um, because the life sciences are so democratized and global, right? And everyone has interest in these areas. Um, they go to where it's cheapest to, to do some of these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, China and India, right, have become huge areas for, for offshoring some of these uh, tools. And so the, the French shoring um, angle on this, right, it is really interesting. Um, you know, if, if the U.S. Uh, wants to, you know, insulate supply chains or, or further identify, you know, developments in optimizing these processes after discoveries are made, let's say here in the U.S. that end up going elsewhere, uh, do you do that in a strategic way? And is there a way to do that in a strategic way with something as broadly accessible as synthetic biology? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it's you know, the enablers for doing synthetic biology, right, are av available anywhere. Uh, and that's one of the most attractive parts about, you know, this this sector of emerging technology is it's not like hypersonics or something where you, you need to be Raytheon, right, or Northrop Grumman to, to work on these things. Yeah, anyone can do it. And the, the challenge is going to be with that in mind, right, and maybe from a national security perspective, this technology set is already out there. Um, where does it make sense for the U.S. to exert, you know, um, policy influence over some of these areas? Mm -hmm. What are the risks of this democratization of this technology? Yeah, so that's another great question. And and as a coronavirus scientist by training, um, right, and as a virologist, uh, you know, I've seen COVID-19 spur this kind of biosecurity mindset, you know, like uh, we really need to be keeping a closer eye on those biosafety level three and four labs. And, you know, we need all this regulation and oversight and things of that nature. Um, the the risks of the democratization of SynBio, I think from a global perspective, right, are more that countries that maybe aren't aligned with our interests or with our partners' interests gain outsized chunks of the global economy by employing biotechnology, right, in a way that's maybe not open and competitive and fair on the international scene. Um, you know, sure, you can come up with a million ways that you could use some bio to create some crazy world-ending epidemic or, you know, um, manipulate the climate in a way that's really detrimental or something like that, right? And there are a lot of those scenarios out there. Uh, I think the more realistic, you know, flip side of the bioeconomy and synthetic biology are really that, unlike those other emerging technology sets where the U.S. is in a pretty good spot in terms of driving the international norms, driving standards, you know, driving a lot of these things that, that ensure that the U.S. economy stays competitive in these areas. We don't have that advantage with synthetic biology. And so it really is democratized. And as a result, you know, if there's a US policy goal to be the number one bioeconomy in the world, uh, we don't have any real unique advantages in that area right now that we could say, yep, this is why we're gonna stay number one or why we're gonna, you know, reclaim that top spot. It's very competitive and very open. Uh, and so I think that's probably the greater risk of the democratization is that, you know, from a, a U.S. centric perspective, we don't hold the keys, you know, like we do in yeah. some of these other emerging technology areas. Yeah, it reminds me of 5G, you know, where we woke up and all of a sudden Huawei was, you know, running the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, right now, every, uh, you know, most rural parts of America run on Huawei. And along with it, you know, their cameras and data collection attached. So that's no good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and from a no, competitive it, it, perspective, I mean, you just don't want the technology to be driven by, um, you know, another government. So our companies don't have any means to compete, um, you know, and they'll price us out. Exactly. And I think that's uh, Beth, a great segue into, you know, how does the U.S. collaborate and work on these problems? Mm -hmm. You know, I think if, if the U.S. and the EU Right. And, and the telecom that's based there had come together and said, hey, we need to ensure that, you know, the, the future G space is a competitive, open, international market space for everybody. Um, I think everyone would have been in agreement with that. Right. And, and like you said, there were some opportunities missed that allowed for essentially one company. Right. That, you know, is, is based out of a country that, that we don't see eye to eye with on a lot of things. 
um, you know, really have preeminence in terms of connectivity to data around the world. Synthetic biology, although we don't quite know what that future looks like, uh, is going to be one of those huge drivers in our ability to, to live with the living world, right, and to really reverse things like climate change and, and do these big existential global things that will be hugely impactful from an economic perspective as well as from a, you know, national security angle. Well, we are, I'm going to open it up to questions in just one minute. Um, I want to end this little session with, um, you know, how do you think forecasting can help? You've talked to us slightly about that. And do you have any advice for forecasters who, you know, might be looking for resources to do um, the forecasting in this area? Yeah. So but why we're all here, right? This is a topic that is prime for forecasting help. Uh, I think we are early in this arena. Um, I think a lot of the thought in terms of synthetic biology futures have been biologists, uh, right? With not very many economists sprinkled in or, you know, not many um, folks who think about commercialization of technology or other emerging technologies, right? I, you know, um, I've been at some of these bioeconomy meetings, but there's no economists, right? <laughs> right? Or there's no one who's been part of those AI and machine learning discussions or microelectronics, right? Who can impart some of their experiences there. And in, a, in an area, right, like I mentioned, that's opaque that we, we probably know less about today than we did five years ago because things aren't published, things aren't patented. Um, there's not big commercial players in the space yet. You know, it's really, it's really hard to get quantitative uh, data on these topics. Um, the forecasting community could be hugely impactful. Uh, so in, in terms of tools that the community has available, I think I would really start with what are other emerging technologies doing? Uh, you know, how have we thought about 5G and AI and quantum and all of these other emerging techs? You know, are there similarities there? Are there differences? Uh, you know, are they on a time scale and economic scale that's, you know, hugely different? And then look at, at least where I like to start is is the policy world, right? So I mean, maybe that's reflexive as a former government employee, but uh, think about some of the non-economic drivers, right? Right. So where are their interests that might force a market in a certain direction or force a technology in a certain direction? You know, if the administration came out today and said, you know, by 2030, 50 percent of all um, fuel has to be synthetic biology derived. Mm -hmm. That'd be a, that'd be a huge transformative change to the market, um, and those things might happen in the near future. And and so having the forecast community think about the ways that other emerging technologies have emerged and then become part of our economy and our national security space, uh, and how we can either draw those lines with synthetic biology or identify areas that it's not the same and it's divergent, and and we need different you know types of thought in this area. Uh, starting with those policy documents and figuring out sort of where the international um, drivers are is a really important place to begin. Great. So, Vanessa, um, do we have any questions from the audience? We do. Should I just go ahead and read them? Yeah. Okay, so one of them is around public perception, Andy. We've seen existing fears among the public around things like GMOs. We see this in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, people have also been concerned about things like cloning, human-machine hybrids, or mRNA vaccines. Could these public fears result in policies or legislation that could potentially hinder the U.S.'s competitiveness in the field? And if so, how can we navigate those fears with progress? I, that is a, a great question, and I can't believe we didn't address it, Beth, in our discussion. I mean, maybe some of the most important drivers are societal. Uh, we're seeing in this current COVID mis and disinformation environment where it's really hard to, to understand what's going on out there. Um, you know, we have mRNA vaccines now, which are really the, the cleanest, uh, most straightforward vaccines we've ever, ever developed. Um, met with a lot of skepticism and, um, again, mis and disinformation. So when we talk about using synthetic biology, right, to engineer living organisms, uh, we're going to run into a, a confluence of factors 
both societally, right, as well as the economics, which we touched on, which are going to probably be barriers. Um, we've seen, you know, anti-GMO movement already when really genetically modified organisms are just, you know, kicking evolution into high gear for a little bit. Um, doing things that we'd be able to do normally with crop selection and crossbreeding, right? But in a way that accelerates that process and does it in a way that controls for the changes that you want to make, you know, to a to a food, for example. So if if there's hesitancy in some of those arenas, um, right? We have vaccine hesitancy, and we probably have a record low of trust in science, especially you know government sponsored science. Uh, we really have to be careful in how we talk about these and include public in the discourse of how these technologies are progressing. Uh, there's also right different, um, more, more societal level um, differences, I think in this area around the world than there are on other technologies. You know, you think about something like future G, and I don't think there's a lot of parts of society that would be like, no, we don't want our phones to get any faster, right? I mean, you, you can bring things down to kind of a basic level, with synthetic biology, you know, if you wanted to discuss the ability to, you know, manipulate a human genome so that we cure a disease, uh, those sorts of discussions get get extremely personal and um, uh, are really challenging to discuss right in a pretty straightforward, you know, scientific manner. So those are all things that I completely agree we have to we have to figure out. You know, I was. Um, working very closely on the U.S. government's COVID-19 vaccine development efforts. Um, very proud, right, of the fact that we got uh, those initial round of COVID vaccines out as fast as we did. What we didn't think about were the other factors. Are people going to take the vaccines? <laughs> you know, how do we best distribute equitably, you know, these vaccines, not only in the U.S., but around the world? Uh, what if we need to change the vaccines? Uh, you know, these sorts of things, uh, I think are, are very um, are questions that are very parallel to how technology development is going to um, be critical to synthetic biology and to our bioeconomy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I answered that other than yes, there <laughs> will be implications that will likely be barriers. <laughs> there are so many good questions here and a lot of them are very um, technical. And I always worry about these sessions because I feel like we have to really important to set this kind of 30,000 viewpoint and not dig in right away. But then I also worry we don't have enough time to ask specific questions about <laughs> these the people who are attending who are like already pretty deep in this topic. Vanessa, do you have another one? We do. We've actually received quite a few questions around the regulatory environment right now for synthetic mm -hmm. biology. Uh, what that legislative environment looks like, especially in the U.S. around SynBio, if if you can, and does the U.S. government, for example, have effective policies and tools in place to deter or defend against future risks like SynBio weapons? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, and, and I'll try to answer this one a little bit more briefly to, to get to some of the other uh, questions that are also out there. But I'd say because we're pretty early. Um, we don't have that framework. And I think when you look at other emerging technologies that have developed into capabilities for the U.S., I don't really think we have those frameworks in place either. Um, now is the right time to be thinking about these things. Um, from a regulatory perspective, you know, I, I think we see a lot of movement in the SynBio world to be non-medical uh, because they don't have to deal with the FDA, right? You don't have to worry about your products uh, going into people and, and affecting physiology. Right. So in terms of if you wanted to make a novel material or, uh, you know, uh, modify food in some way, a lot of that is unregulated until you get to the point where you're hitting the market. Um, so, you know, th th there are definite gaps in the ways that, that we think about this, although it's always important to consider, you know, the offsetting points of innovation and having an, an environment that's uh, conducive to innovation and discovery. Um, you know, because a lot of these things are, are being done, you know, in the commercial and academic sectors, uh, you want to have environments that help people innovate and discover. Uh, and you don't want to be, especially in this emerging space, 
uh, you don't want to slow that down or deter uh, investment in the U.S., for example, when you can maybe do these things easier elsewhere. So there's a real balance. And that is a just like the, the last question. I don't think anyone has the answer on this yet. However, from a like promotion of the bioeconomy and having, you know, our big economic drivers here in the U.S. understand that the bioeconomy is going to be critical. Those things have to be included from the get go because it's very hard like for cyber, for example, uh, to go backwards and do things like regulation and security and, and all those, you know, not sexy parts of technology development, but critical, especially if you're thinking about broader impacts uh, to national security and the economy. There's a question I don't wanna miss here about um, what do people read that is on Synbio to keep up with kind of the discussion in that community of interest. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. There is no like Synbio Society, uh, right? Um, you can read we some. Should start one. Yeah, we should start one. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it is it is hard to get any sort of digestible like kind of scientific literature on this topic. Either it's like really hard science journal articles uh, and reviews on, on different uses of synthetic biology for impactful applications, right? Or it's it's very high level type stuff that's maybe not all that informative. Um, so there is a big niche in, into translating what synthetic biology might do and might lead to into discourse that is you know able to be accessible by someone who doesn't have a PhD in biochemistry. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think there are some gaps. I, I think this this question and the fact that we're tackling this topic here today is a great start because, like I said at the on onset, it, we can't just have a bunch of biologists answering these huge questions. You really need, you know, a, a broad input from a bunch of different subject matter expert areas in political science and economics and uh, manufacturing and, and all those sorts of areas in addition to how the public thinks these technologies are going to be impactful. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's not a good answer. <laughs> yeah. So like, where do I go to read up on Symbio? Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you because honestly it, it's, it's on those both ends of those spectrums. Right. Um, now, now th you know, magazines and periodicals like MIT technology review, um, you know, I, they, they touch on the, these topics from time to time. And there's a few national security relevant publications that have um, published some op-eds and commentaries from some of my colleagues about these areas. Mm -hmm. So there are some things out there, but you really do have to have to look to find them. Someone mentioned Nature as a publication that sometimes has good stuff. Uh, na nature has great stuff, right? In the, in the front matter. Um, and most of the good juicy stuff that you're going to want, right, is buried in those research articles, you know, uh, um, further into the journal. Okay, I'm not reading that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nature, science are a great, nature and science uh, are a great way, I, I think, to start because they have included a lot of um, science communications type literature up front. Uh, so that, that's a great place to start. Okay, my last question, it's two o'clock. Um, have you thought about this? I warned you on this one. If you had a million dollars or maybe $10 million, um, where would you invest it in synthetic biology? You know, Beth, you did warn me about this and I've been... <laughs> <laughs> I'm brain space okay, but um, would you do it like, would it be fuel? Would it be food? Would it be um, uh, pharma? So it, it's sad to say, as someone who currently works in the like biomedical arena, it would be anything but biomedical. If I wanted to to develop a synthetic biology toolkit, something that that has been discovered into a, into something that's commercially viable, and you have some level of certainty of the outputs, I would stay away from from medicine. Um, I think fuels and materials um and it, maybe fuels and combined with um fuel byproducts or things that the chemical industry you know has in limited supply uh what we found over and over again is that biology has ways to do this that are really fascinating 
and are in a lot of cases much easier and you can stip, you know, skip a few of the steps in a traditional chemical process right, to get to your end product. Um, I would focus a lot in identifying where those seams might be, right, where the existing commercial infrastructure might be lacking and where we might have sole source materials or feedstocks that are of you know, limited quantity and discover ways for bacteria and yeast to, to make that. Um, so yes, that's I would put it in the bi uh, biochemicals, biofuels mm -hmm. space for sure. I don't know anything, but you know what I would do is I would find a replacement for polyester so we would stop filling our landfill with disposable clothes and all the, it's just such a petroleum waste and terrible. And th there are, there are companies that are exploring, um, you know, synthetic uh, bio fabrics. Um, yeah, I'm for right? that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm for all of it. Ways to make these clothes and plastic products and things like that in a way that's environmentally friendly um, and in a way that reduces reliance on, you know, crude oil as a feedstock. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, I think Vanessa is going to like uh, give us the hook here. Vanessa? Thanks, Beth. I actually don't have much to close this out other than thanks everybody for joining. Um, we'll be sending out a link to the recording after this and be sure to catch the questions that we have in our new topic on INFER around how synthetic biology will transform U.S. competitiveness in the energy sector in particular. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, and we will look forward to our next chat. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to do a paid advertisement or unpaid one before we yeah. shut down? Yes, thanks for the reminder, Beth. Our next fireside chat is going to be on September 29th. Uh, save the date for that one. And it's going to be about uh, winning the global AI race. So we'll talk about different national AI strategies. So this was a poolside chat. Maybe that won't be fireside. We'll see. Climate change. <laughs> <laughs> I really thanks appreciate everybody. it. Right, everyone. And Beth, thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, this was great. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. So good to work with you again. And thanks, everybody. And keep forecasting. Have a good one.